The World Series between the Phillies and the Astros is in full swing, which is a great time for baseball. But it's also a great time for the Orioles because we're less than a week away from the official start of the offseason. And because of that, I know you all have Orioles questions and I have answers coming up on this Mailbag Monday edition of the Locked On Orioles podcast. You are Locked On Orioles, your daily Baltimore Orioles podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Orioles fans. Today is Monday, October 31st, 2022. Happy Halloween and welcome back in to the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. As always, I'm your host, Connor Newcomb. And coming up on today's episode, it is a Mailbag Monday edition of of the pod once again. I've got nine Orioles questions to answer, all from you, the listeners, and we'll get to all of them here on this episode. We'll talk about the Orioles going after starting pitching. Is Jacob deGrom really a possibility for the Orioles this offseason? We'll talk about some potential trades for the O's, what the Orioles could do in the infield if they signed one of the big-name shortstops. We'll talk about extensions for their rookies and a look at some key dates throughout this offseason, plus more. That's all coming up on this episode of the Locked On Orioles podcast. But before we get there, just did want to thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. We're free and available on all podcast listening platforms, and we're still five days a week here through at least the end of this week, Monday through Friday, brand new episodes of Locked On Orioles. And then even when the offseason officially begins, still we'll have three episodes a week here on the pod. Generally, we'll come out Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays for all your Orioles content right here. So make sure to subscribe wherever you listen or watch here on the Locked On Orioles YouTube channel. And again, we thank you for making Locked On Orioles your first podcast listen of the day. For your first listen today, it is Mailbag Monday. We thank you all so much for getting in your Orioles questions. If you did submit a question and it is not answered on today's episode, don't worry. Check back in next Monday for our next Mailbag Monday episode, and you will have your questions answered. If you want to submit a question to be answered on a future Mailbag Monday episode, you can go on Twitter and you can tweet at Locked On Orioles or tweet at me at Connor Newcomb underscore. You can also direct message either of those accounts. The DMs are open. To get those questions in, you can email us at LockedOnOrioles at gmail.com. You can put a comment on our YouTube videos, on our Locked On Orioles YouTube page, and you can leave a question in the review section on Apple Podcasts when you leave a rating, hopefully a five-star rating, and a review there as well. But let's jump right into our mailbag here. And our first question comes from at Obertle on Twitter, who asks, if the Orioles do sign a starting pitcher, in free agency this offseason, are you okay with it being kind of a middle-tier guy? Because there are those top-of-the-line guys out there. Carlos Rodon, you know, Jacob deGrom could be an option. We'll talk about him a little bit later. But Bertle actually mentioned three names to consider. Mike Clevenger, Tyler Anderson, and Martin Perez. Now, all three of these guys are going to be free agents this offseason, and certainly None of them are aces at this point in their career, but each of them has a serious upside. And to answer the question in a bigger scope, I think for now I am, because I really don't believe the Orioles right now are going to go spend on the big top of the rotation ace guy. I think they could try to trade for that kind of pitcher, but if they're going in free agency, I think they're going to dip more into this middle tier of the starting pitcher. So in that sense, I would be okay with it. But these three names, we'll start with Mike Clevenger, who missed all of 2021 after Tommy John surgery and returned to the mound later in the year this year with the Padres. He threw 114 and a third innings off of Tommy John, had a 4.33 ERA, a 4.98 FIP, just seven strikeouts per nine for Clevenger, which was one of his lowest numbers of his career. He did not look like the same pitcher he was pre-Tommy John. Of course, had those great years in Cleveland, then was traded to the Padres, had a really good 2020 with San Diego before the industry, for the injury, I should say. But his fastball velocity was down from 95 to 93 this year. He was horrendous in his two postseason starts for the Padres. And even though he was great before his injury, especially in Cleveland, he just didn't look like the same pitcher. Now, all of that makes you think, oh, let's stay away from Mike Clevenger. But maybe a lot of that brings his price down in free agency. 
And again, he's 32 years old, but if the Orioles still think he's got, you know, two, three, four years in him where they can find something to help him click as now this post Tommy John pitcher, maybe you can get him fairly cheap on a, you know, a, a two year, 20 ish million dollar deal and kind of fix him a little bit and help him in your rotation. If they think that's the case, I wouldn't mind Mike Clevenger. Now, a guy who had an amazing year is Tyler Anderson. He was pitching on a one-year, $8 million deal with the Los Angeles Dodgers this year, and he was just fantastic. 178 and two-thirds innings, had a 2.57 ERA with a 3-3-1 FIP. Just seven strikeouts, but less than two walks per nine for Anderson, who is going to be 33 next year, but he had a career year. But it was an interesting year in which he had his lowest strikeout numbers of his career, but the best ERA of his career. So pitching for the Dodgers just kind of helps you, I think, and, and they're able to find what works best. But he had an 85-mile-per-hour average exit velocity against him this year. That was one of the best in all of baseball. He threw more change-ups. Opponents hit less than 180 against that change-up. The Dodgers kind of figured out how, well, he's not striking guys out anymore. How do we get soft contact? They did that. And he's maybe one of these two years, $25 million guys. I think the Orioles could and should go after. And then the last guy is Martin Perez. He'll be 32 years old. Had an amazing year with the Texas Rangers. 196 innings to a 2.89 ERA. About eight Ks and three walks per nine this year. It was by far his best season. He's a big ground ball pitcher, but doesn't really have that elite pitch. His changeup is solid, but he may have gotten a little lucky. And maybe if he continues to pitch, he's not going to have a year like that. And the other thing is, the Rangers really want him back, and it seems like he does want to be back in Texas. So he may not even make it really big time to free agency, but certainly an option. And to answer the question, I'd be okay with any of those guys joining the Orioles rotation. Second question, this one comes via Jacob Paul on Twitter, who asks, do you think the Orioles will make a splash trade? And I've talked about this a lot on previous mailbag episodes, just on episodes in general. But this is more of a general question, just do you think they're going to do it? I honestly think they're going to try and whether or not they do it. A lot of it has to do with, you know, it's 50% the other team saying yes on the deal, but I do think they're going to try. And I think it's going to be for a starting pitcher. I don't think they would go out and make a splash trade for a hitter unless, you know, the spot was really right for that. And I do think some combination of Jordan Westberg and Joey Ortiz and maybe some younger big leaguers or some other prospects to maybe go after an ace. I could even see them including a guy like Colton Kowser if they were really getting a big number one pitcher, but I do think they're at least going to try. Will it happen? We'll see. But I think they will try. Next question comes from Seven on Twitter, who asks, does it make sense for the Orioles to sign Michael Conforto this offseason? This is definitely a good question because many baseball fans, I think including myself for a little bit, kind of forgot about Michael Conforto because he did not play in the 2022 Major League Baseball season. Remember, Conforto spent all that time with the New York Mets, and had kind of a down year in 2021, his last year with the Mets, about 125 games. He hit just 232, 14 homers, just a 106 WRC+. plus. I mean, he was a better than average hitter, but he was certainly not the hitter he was earlier with the Mets. From 2017 to 2020, I mean, he put up elite offensive numbers for four consecutive years with the New York Mets. Left-handed hitting outfielder can you know play right and left. He can play, play a little center field as well for you. Hits for power, hits for average, a lot of doubles. He was a great hitter, but he just looked injured at the end of last year with the Mets, didn't look right, and then he didn't get signed all offseason. And many thought, well, maybe he's still injured. And then when he was still a free agent, of course, some of the reason why he didn't get signed all offseason was there was a lockout, but he didn't get signed when the lockout ended. And then he got shoulder surgery in April, which basically put him out for three or four months. No one signed him on rehab. And there was word that he was maybe good to go around August and the team could have gone after him, but nobody signed him. He remained a free agent. And now he goes back into this offseason as a free agent. Now, if he was healthy enough to play for the last month or two of this year, he certainly will be healthy and ready to go for opening day 2023. I think the Orioles could use an outfielder, a left-handed hitter to put in that lineup, play some outfield, do some DHing. So if he's healthy, and he's going to be fairly cheap probably after not playing for a whole year and coming off a concerning shoulder surgery, you would think, especially for a hitter like that. I would do it. If he's going to come cheap and you can give him a, a chance to be the Michael Conforto he was before the injury with the Mets, let's do it. I would definitely be down for that. 
I don't know what kind of deal Conforto is going to end up taking. I know he has a Scott Boris client, but after the injury and not playing for a year, there's just kind of no way to know whether he'll take like a one year, $10 million deal, or if he's still looking for kind of the long-term extension, because this was his first time in free agency you really just don't know, but I, I wouldn't mind seeing the Orioles kick the tires on Michael Conforto, but Michael Conforto isn't the only former Met who the Orioles could be kicking the tires on this offseason in free agency. Jacob deGrom, if he opts out, could be a free agent. And there was word floating around Twitter the other day that the Orioles may be interested. So coming up next, we'll continue to answer your questions and talk about just that. Jacob deGrom in an Orioles uniform? But first, got to tell you about betonline.net, which is your number one source for betting football and the start of the new basketball season. And of course, the rest of the World Series as well. You can get all the lines, all the odds, everything you need for game three starting tonight between the Phillies and the Astros. For Monday night football tonight and every week of the NFL season, college football as well, the NBA, the NHL, and hey, college basketball starting in a couple weeks as well. Every line, look at news, listen to podcasts, in-depth analysis on every game out there. They've got live betting, up-to-the-minute scores for every sport you can imagine. It's the fastest and easiest way to check in on all your favorite games and events, MMA, boxing, golf, all included as well. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. So we're back here on a Mailbag Monday episode of the podcast, answering your Orioles questions here on the pod. We thank you for making Locked on Orioles your first listen today. For your second listen today, check out the Locked on Sports Today podcast. From the games that matter to the most biggest stories in sports, go beyond the scoreboard and behind the scenes with local experts and insights only Locked on can provide. Locked On Sports Today, available on this app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. So back to our Mailbag Monday episode here. Our fourth question of the day comes from Milo on Twitter, who just sent me the tweet about the Orioles and Jacob deGrom from this week and said, just wanted to get your thoughts on this. Well, here was the tweet. It was from Rob Pearsall, who I had never interacted with or seen on Twitter. He is verified as the editor-in-chief of Mets Legends, a site with a podcast that covers the New York Mets. And he tweeted basically along the lines of, I'm hearing the Orioles could be in on Jacob deGrom this offseason. That's a lot of coulds and hearings and what-ifs. And considering the fiasco we went on with verified reporters and the Orioles being connected to Carlos Correa last offseason... I'm not going to jump directly into the deep end again and say the Orioles are in on Jacob deGrom. But if they were, I would be incredibly excited because what better way to get an ace at the top of your rotation than Jacob deGrom? Now, it is not concrete that he's going to be a free agent just yet. He has an ability to opt out after this season of his Mets deal. If not, I believe he would have two more years under contract with the Mets, but the belief is that he is going to opt out because he could get more money in free agency. Now the Mets could certainly re-sign him in free agency just for a bigger contract, but here's what we saw from DeGrom this year. He's 34 years old, and of course, he's been injured a bit lately. He has not thrown over 100 innings in a season since 2019. He had three consecutive 200-plus inning season, 17, 18, and 19. Then he had, of course, a shortened 20 season. Then he dealt with multiple injuries last year, and he dealt with injuries this year. This year, for the match, Jacob DeGrom threw just 64 and a third innings. Now, he did have a 3.08 ERA, he had 2.13 FIP. He struck out over 14 batters per nine and walked just 1.1 batter per nine. I mean, when he pitched those 64 innings, he was the best starting pitcher in baseball, full stop. But he wasn't out there a lot. And he's had some injury issues and he's going to be, you know, 35 at some point next season. He's probably looking at something around maybe four years, $160 million here for his next contract. He's, you know, at least going to be worth around $40 million per year. It depends on how short or how long he wants this next contract to be. You know, maybe someone could get him with something like two years, a hundred million and just load up the annual value for a shorter time. 
But if the Orioles are willing to spend that money, yeah, go get Jacob DeGrom. I'm all for it. But from this one tweet, I am not going to jump in yet and say we're on DeGrom watch. Next question comes from Ben Appel on Twitter, who asks, if the Orioles signed one of the big shortstops like Trey Turner or Carlos Correa, would you play them shortstop or would you play them at second base? This is a good question because it's something I've alluded to a little bit here on the pod when I've talked about these couple of guys and, and why I want the Orioles to sign them. It will obviously have a lot to do with what else the Orioles do this offseason. Like, if that's the move they make, that's the one move they make, everybody else is still around. You know, Ramon Arias is still here. Jorge Mateo is still here. Obviously, Gunnar Henderson's there. And then you have Taron Vavra still here. And then Jordan Westberg and Joey Ortiz are coming to the big leagues. It would be interesting. But maybe it's different if they trade Arias or they trade Westberg or Ortiz in, in, in one of these you know big deals to go get another piece to help this team. But I think what I would do right now if that's like the one big free agent i would say you would put that free agent whether it's turner or correa at second base now both of those guys took steps back defensively at shortstop this year carlos correa is a gold glove finalist at shortstop in the american league for no reason whatsoever jorge mateo is not despite winning the fielding bible award for the best shortstop in all of baseball the fielding bible knows what's going on the gold glove does not but correa is not a gold glover at shortstop anymore and Trey Turner kind of never was. You know, he played center field early in his career with the Nats as well. And he played some second base with the Dodgers. He can play there. And I'm confident Correa can play second base as well. I would probably move one of them to second. And I would stick Jorge Mateo still at shortstop with Gunnar Henderson at third to start the year. Now, could you switch that if you really trust Turner or Correa? And defense is a little different next year. With the ban on the shift implemented, you need a, a rangier second baseman than you've ever needed before. So that position becomes even more important defensively. Then, yeah, I could see Jorge Mateo maybe playing there. But I would keep him at short if he's going to stay in your lineup. And I'd put either Turner or Correa at second with Henderson at third. Now, if there's more mix-up on the roster, or maybe if Jordan Westberg is just hitting the cover off the ball and he has to be promoted and they don't trade him, and maybe he takes Mateo's spot in the starting lineup, then I would put Turner or Correa at short, or I might even put Westberg at third, put them at second, and put Henderson at short. Because really at this point, just strictly defensively, I'd rather have Mateo or Henderson defensively at shortstop over a guy like Correa or Turner. So I do think it's a pretty good chance that if the O's would bring them in, they would play some second base. Now, it's something that they'd have to buy into, but I think it would benefit the Orioles to have them over at second. Next question comes from Layla's dad on Twitter, who asks, why do you want to trade Jordan Westberg and Joey Ortiz before they get to the big leagues? Now, this account had a, an initial question about why do you not like Westberg and Ortiz, then amended it to say, why do you want to trade them? And I think it was good that this person amended it because I have never said I don't like Westberg or Ortiz. Now, I Joey Ortiz has been my guy since I was calling his summer league games in 2017, I still don't know if this season is just a flash in the pan or what we're really going to see from him offensively. He's always been elite defensively. Jordan Westberg, though, I believe in is going to be a good big league hitter. But here's why, you know, and some of the question was about, you know, why not let them get to the big leagues first to see what they are before you trade them? That's kind of the whole reason you trade prospects because all prospects don't work out. In fact, a lot of prospects don't work out. You know, you've got 26 players on an active roster at any given time. And not all those 26 guys on every 30 teams are good big league players. Maybe about half of them on average are, maybe a little more than half. So, I mean, you're looking at, you know, 450, 500, like good big leaguers among prospects. Even just on top 30 lists for all 30 teams, there's 900 players right there. I mean, half these guys aren't really going to pan out. And so... The reason I say that is because when they're still in the minors and they still have these great numbers in the minors, they still have that prospect shine. And now, even if you never get promoted, you can lose that shine. If you struggle or get injured, just look at using the Diaz. But a guy like Jordan Westberg, once he's still in the minors and has an incredible year, a guy like Joey Ortiz, who just hit everything at the end of the season in double and triple A, those two guys have a lot of value right now, a lot of prospect shine. And maybe the Orioles could trade them to go get, you know, big league starting pitching. 
and get a team to maybe overvalue them. I'm not saying neither of them are going to be good big leaguers, but once you put them in the bigs, major league pitching is far and away so much better than triple A pitching. It takes guys a while to adjust. We saw Adley Rutschman struggle to adjust. We didn't see Gunnar Henderson struggle, but we saw guys like Bobby Witt and Julio Rodriguez struggle to adjust. And Jordan Westberg and Joey Ortiz, I'm sorry, are nowhere close to the talent level of those names I just mentioned, Henderson, Rutschman, Rodriguez. These guys are fringe top 100 prospects. These are, you know, somewhere between 80 and, and 120 among the best prospects in all of baseball. You know, they're top 10 Orioles prospects, but they're fringe top 100 guys. Those four guys I mentioned were all top five prospects in all of baseball. So you would expect these guys to struggle a little bit when they get to the big leagues. We've seen it with a whole lot of guys. We saw it with Kyle Stowers, you know, and, and he was around their prospect pedigree. He struggled early. If you trade him now, all they have is shine. This offseason, you can't say a bad thing about Westberg or Ortiz. If you bring them up next year, you know, they get some time in the big leagues, they get 100 plate appearances. And then you try to trade them at the deadline next year. If there's any struggles, they lose a little bit of that shine. Now teams are still saying, hey, they're young. They're facing big league pitching for the first time. Teams know that. But you don't have that same prospect shine. And teams that love prospects are going to pay a little bit more. And they're going to be maybe willing to part with that ace if you're going to give them these two names like Westberg and Ortiz. And that's why I specifically put those guys out there. Because... I think the Orioles should sign one of these big free agent infielders, which is going to make it tougher for these two guys to play in the bigs. And I don't care how good they are in AAA. Neither of these guys are better than Trey Turner or Carlos Correa or Xander Bogarts or Dansby Swanson or whomever right now. And may never be better than those guys. There's a good chance they're ne- those guys are all-stars. There's a good chance these fringe top 100 prospects are never all-stars in the big leagues, even though they've had great numbers in the minors. So if you can trade them now, and get a big-time free agent or big-time trade piece, you know, top part of the rotation starting pitcher, you do it in the snap of a finger because this development system and this farm system run by Michael Elias and Sigma Dell has been so good at churning out talent and developing talent, and we're starting to see it, they can have the next guy coming up right behind Ortiz and Westberg, you know, whether it's it's Kobe Mayo or, you know, it's it's some of these guys figured it out in, in the lower minor leagues. Maybe Anthony Servideo comes back or it's Jackson Holiday coming up in a couple of years or, you know, Reed Trimble getting back on his feet or Heston Kerstad or all these guys are ready to come right behind him to add to this talent pool in the minor leagues and eventually the major leagues. But these are guys, especially Ortiz with this breakout year, you could capitalize and you can still replace that depth in the minor leagues while capitalizing on them to get big league talent. Big league talent is better than prospects in every scenario. And that's why I talk about wanting to trade them, because I think they're kind of the perfect pieces now for the Orioles to go get some starting pitching. We got three more questions to answer coming up on today's Mailbag Monday episode. Talk a little bit about what the Orioles lineup would look like here in a couple of years. Talk about extensions for some of the Orioles rookies and some dates you need to know for this Orioles offseason. So we're back here with three final questions on a Mailbag Monday episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for sending in all your questions. Again, if they didn't get answered today, keep sending in those questions. Email us, tweet at us, you know, put it in the YouTube comments right here. We will answer your mailbag questions on our next Mailbag Monday episode. Looking to probably do them most Mondays throughout the offseason, unless, of course, there is breaking news around a Monday with the Orioles adding to their team. But our seventh question of the day comes from Yoni via Twitter, who asks, assuming there are no trades or no free agent signings, and I added in no extensions given, what would the Orioles 2024 opening day lineup look like? So anybody who's going to be a free agent after that, I took out. And of course, without the Orioles trading for anyone or signing anyone in free agency. So basically it's guys on the big league roster now, who were signed through 2024 and beyond, and the prospects. Here's what I came up with. Leading off at shortstop, Gunnar Henderson. Batting second and catching is Adley Rutschman. Batting third, playing right field is Colton Kowser. Batting fourth and DHing is Anthony Santander. Batting fifth, playing first base is Ryan Mountcastle. Batting sixth, playing center field is Cedric Mullins. Batting seventh and playing third base is Jordan Westberg. Batting eighth and playing left field is Kyle Stowers. And batting ninth and playing second base is Connor Norby with Grayson Rodriguez 
as your starting pitcher. Again, that's for 2024, not 23. And assuming the O's make no moves trade-wise or free agent-wise, that could be a good lineup. But uh, please, Orioles, let's make some trades and some free agent signings to make it even better a couple years from now. Next question comes from Jody on Twitter, who asks, why do both sides usually agree to these early contract extensions that guys sign in their rookie years? You know, most notably this year, we saw Julio Rodriguez sign one with the Seattle Mariners, and we've seen a boatload of Atlanta Braves players sign some over the past few years. You know, Austin Riley just signed one. We saw, you know, their two breakout rookies, Michael Harris and Spencer Strider, both signed those kind of deals as well. And it's also a good question for the Orioles mailbag because it's something we'd like the Orioles to do right now with Adley Rutschman and maybe getting close to that time with Gunnar Henderson as well. But the question was kind of why do they sign them? Why do both sides agree to these extensions? And I think the reason behind the question is, A, for ownership, when they sign these extensions, you know, they have to pay. Let's take Julio Rodriguez. They have to pay him a lot more over his first three years. If they don't sign him to an extension – before he's arbitration eligible, you know, he's making well less than a million dollars every single year for being one of the best players in baseball. You sign him to the extension, he makes a lot more than that in those years. And on the player side, the, re- the reason you're asking, well, why do they do this? Is that, well, when you're signing an extension as a rookie, you're basically pulling down your market value. You know, if you wait two, three years and you continue to amass seasons like this, market value goes up, your value goes up, and you're going to get more money on that extension in the end. Well, the reason, despite those two factors that each side will generally agree to these deals is that from the owner side and management ship side, it's nice to kind of know how much you're going to play or pay this young player throughout his time in the big leagues with you. The way that arbitration works in the big leagues, you have those three years, then you go to the you know three to four years of arbitration as well. And in arbitration each year, your salary is determined by your play on the field the year before. So you could have a player who makes, you know, $2 million in his first year of arbitration and then just lights the world on fire and makes eight, nine, ten million million in his second year of arbitration. That's a big jump that maybe you weren't preparing for on the books. And if you're a team like the Dodgers or the Yankees or whoever, you don't really care. But if you're a smaller market team, quote unquote, or, you know, an ownership group that isn't willing to spend a whole lot, that makes a huge difference in your budget, especially when it's one of your most important players. So they like to sign these deals that even though, yeah, you pay a little bit more on the front end, you know exactly how much you're paying this player every year. You buy out those years of arbitration like they talk about. And so you can set a number on, you know, Michael Harris's 2026 payroll value. Instead of having to wait for arbitration, you know exactly how much you're going to pay him that year. And the other reason they like it is The players become cheaper later. It's just the sense of it. You know, you sign a star player like Julio Rodriguez, even though Julio Rodriguez got a good amount of money in that Mariners extension, he's going to be so good that five years down the line, when he's about halfway through that extension, if he were to become a free agent, he would make much more money in free agency if he keeps on this track of being a star in Major League Baseball than he's going to make on the current deal he signed. I mean, even look at a guy like Michael Harris of the Braves. He's either going to finish first or second in rookie of the year voting this year in the National League. Great outfielder, great bat, good speed, good defender, just a great all-around player. He signed an eight-year, $72 million deal. That's $9 million a year. So yeah, you're paying Michael Harris around $9 million next year. That's way more than he would have made, which would have been less than $1 million, making essentially the second-year salary. But... In year six, when Harris in arbitration may have made $20 million because he's a star player, if you're only paying him nine, that's a big win for the Atlanta Braves front office. And the other thing is, you know, some of these star, star players like Julio Rodriguez could be Mookie Betts at the end. He made about $30 million in his last year of arbitration. That's a lot of money in arbitration. So you can still save that money, even if you're giving guys big numbers on these extensions as well. Like Julio Rodriguez, he could make that much or more. He could be better than Mookie Betts. And the other thing too is guys have more trade value when you kind of know how much money is on their contract. If you have a young guy who you've already signed to an extension and then you go into a rebuild, you know, three, four years down the line, if you're looking to trade that guy, another team enjoys that they know how much they're going to pay him every year instead of having to take on a guy and then pay him in arbitration, have that number go up, up, and up every single year. 
On the flip side for the player, the number one big thing why they accept it is financial stability. I mean, instead of making whatever it is, you know, 600, 700,000 next season, you know, Michael Harris is going to make 9 million or Julio Rodriguez is going to make 10, 12 million or whatever he's going to make. And when you're a young player who's grinded through the minor leagues and has had these crappy, crappy, terrible minor league baseball conditions, if someone says, hey, you sign this contract, you'll make $9 million to play baseball for us just next year. And we'll guarantee you $72 million in total because it's guaranteed money. That is an, a pretty easy yes, I think, for a, a young person to say. And there's a lot of takes about, you know, oh, this is bad for the union, bad for the players moving forward. And I see that side of it. But if you were the player who had grinded through the minors and was offered $9 million next year and in total $72 million guaranteed right now, you would take that money and it gives you job security. You know, you, you have a team signing you to an eight-year contract, a team that's winning like the Braves, and you think, oh, yeah, I like it here in Atlanta, I'm going to be here. So, you know, that's that's the reason that the younger guys will accept these deals and why the teams give them out. You know, yeah, he's going to be worth more in seven or eight years, but he gets that money now and that's key. And it seems like that's helped keep this Braves team together and this core together as they've signed all these guys for many, many years down the line. So for Adley Rutschman, try to get it done. If you can get him signed to an eight, nine, $10 million deal, whatever it may be, $15 million a year, let's do it. I don't know exactly what that deal is going to look like, but let's get it done right now. Let's lock him up and move on to free agency. Now, our last question of the day here on this mailbag episode comes from Baltimore Modern on Twitter, who asks, could you give me a baseball offseason for dummies? Basically, the key dates for the MLB offseason. Now, I was going to wait to answer this question until next week when we'll have more clarity, because we actually don't get these official dates until the offseason really starts, so after the World Series ends. But we can look back at previous years and kind of give out the dates on what goes in the offseason. So again, these are not official dates yet. I don't think we get them till after the World Series sometime in early November. But essentially, free agency opens five days after the World Series ends. So if the World Series goes seven games, game seven would be Saturday night, and then you go five days after that. So next Thursday would be when free agency would open. That would be November 10th. Now, again, if the World Series ends before seven games, that date would be sooner, but that's the latest date that free agency could start would be November 10th. Now, those five days in between the World Series and free agency, guys or guys can actually re-sign with their teams, but they can't sign with another team. Now, you rarely see guys sign there because most players, if they haven't been extended already, they want to test the open market before deciding. That's why you rarely see guys sign in that spot, but... That five days after is also the deadline for players and teams and you know mutual options to be accepted or declined. So for example, five days after the World Series, the latest November 10th, is the deadline for Jordan Lyles' option. So the Orioles have that deadline to either pick up his $11 million option, bring him back for next year, or decline his option, buy him out for $1 million, and Lyles becomes a free agent. So five days after the World Series ends, that will be kind of the Orioles' first deadline. And then the one other deadline that is also five days after the World Series, again, November 10th would be the latest, is that is the deadline to activate guys who are on the 60-day injured list. Now, remember, if guys get long-term injuries throughout the season and they are on the 60-day injured list, they actually get taken off the 40-man roster because of injury to open spots for other guys. But if you end the year on the 60-day injured list, you do have to be reinstated to the 40-man roster within those five days of the World Series ending. Now, the Orioles had two guys end the season on the 60-day injury list. And actually, on Sunday, they already made a decision on one of them. So the two guys were John Means and Chris Ellis. Chris Ellis, the guy we haven't really talked about much on this pod. He pitched a couple of times early in the year, went down with a shoulder injury, got surgery in April, and missed the rest of the season, kind of similar to what happened to John Means, just not as important of an arm for the Orioles. But Ellis, who had come over off waivers from the Rays late in 2021, actually had five pretty solid starts for the Orioles down the stretch last year and made the opening day roster this year, just had an unfortunate injury. 
The Orioles already have on Sunday reinstated him to the 40 man roster and then outrighted him. So he went on waivers. Nobody claimed him. And Ellis is now in triple a with the O's. So he stays in the organization, but is off the 40 man roster. The Orioles also outrighted Aramis Garcia off the 40 man roster. He was one of the two catchers. The O's claimed off waiver from the reds a couple weeks ago. So he also cleared through waivers and stayed in the organization. Something I figured they would do with some of those catchers, if not all of them. So right now, the Orioles 40-man roster sits at 39 players. They have one spot open. And of course, John Means is still on the 60-day injured list. So even if they do nothing at all, and even if they do pick up Jordan Lyle's option, they currently still do have one open spot for when they have to activate John Means. You will place him on the 40-man roster again. And again, that roster will be full. Then your other dates you need to know, right around mid-November is the qualifying offer deadline. The Orioles won't have any free agents. They'll give a qualifying offer to. And then right around mid-November as well, again, don't have an exact date. It'll probably be November 20-something will be the Rule 5 protection deadline. So that will be the deadline for the Orioles to decide which prospects who are Rule 5 eligible they want to protect on the 40-man roster and protect from the Rule 5 draft. Now, the big ones this year, the big name really by far is Grayson Rodriguez. The Orioles are obviously going to protect him. There's a couple more big names as well, but Rodriguez, the big one. So they'll have to have a couple of 40 man roster spots open, maybe four or five of them by that time to make that decision. Then you have the winter meetings, which are December 4th through the 7th at the winter meetings every year is when the rule five draft happens usually happens one of the final two days of the meeting. So I would think either December 6th or 7th will be the rule five draft when the Orioles may lose some prospects. They don't protect can also pick some prospects from other organizations to put on their 40 man roster. And then right around that time as well, maybe a day or two before the winter meeting starts. So it could potentially be like December 2nd or 3rd will be the non tender deadline as well. So that is the deadline for teams to decide for their arbitration eligible players, which the Orioles have six of this season. If they would like to tender them a contract in arbitration, go to arbitration, figure out that number next year, or just non-tender them, which basically means we don't want to pay what you would be worth. We're just releasing you essentially non-tendering you and making you a free agent. Cam Gallagher would maybe fit that for the O's and potentially maybe Austin Hayes, but I don't think so, but they would have about until December 2nd or 3rd to do that as well. And again, thank you for that question. Dates will be finalized after the World Series ends. But remember, five days after the World Series ends is when free agency starts. And hopefully, it is liftoff for the Baltimore Orioles. But we thank you so much for listening to today's pod. Again, make sure to like, subscribe to the pod, like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube as well. A little longer mailbag episode, but wanted to get to all of your questions here on a Mailbag Monday. And I'll be back on the podcast tomorrow. We'll jump right back in to reviewing seasons for a bunch of Orioles players here in 2022, talking about what made this O's team so, so special. But again, that's coming up on tomorrow's episode. Until then, I'm Connor Newcomb, and this has been the Locked On Orioles podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day.